I'm going to talk about secure microservices-based APIs. It's, it's a little bit different than a lot of the other talks that I have listened to here um, in the sense that it sort of it is what happens after we do all the things that I've listened to. There's authentication takes place. I haven't listened to that many talks that talk about a token being issued and then you're calling an API that's being secured. So this is sort of the much later stage than what a lot of the other talks are discussing, I think, at least the ones that I've heard. Um, my name is Jonas Igbom. I work at a company called Curity. It's a small um, Swedish company. Um, if you detect an accent, some do, um, some don't, it, it's high or low. Um, I am originally from Sweden, but I've lived in the U.S. for almost 20 years now. Um, I have many hats at Curity, so I do technical pre-sales, but I also are involved in um, product market engineering work, which is code examples and a bunch of technical articles on our website and things like that. <clears throat> so, the first part of this is to look at what, what is API growth and what are large-scale APIs and, and what does that look like? And then we're going to start looking at a couple of technologies and techniques and standards to some degree that help us mitigate some of the problems when APIs grow really big in one direction or another or both. Um, we'll go into looking at different layers in the stack where we can enforce and um, look at authorization for APIs. The last part, um, entitlement management system or EMS, is sort of one of those layers, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that because I did spend about seven years at a company called Axiomatics that do exactly that. So I have quite a bit of experience in sort of fine grain authorization as it relates to an entitlement management system. If you look at APIs, um, there's essentially two ways, or I mean, I guess it could be three ways when these are combined, but two, two ways in that they can grow um, wide or they can grow deep. If you combine the two, that's a horrible situation, obviously, but um, the, the the APIs growing wide, what we mean by that is essentially uh, APIs that end up exposing lots and lots and lots of endpoints. Deep APIs is when, essentially when you end up in a true microservice um, infrastructure or architecture where you have a lot of different APIs calling subsequent APIs um, in the end. So you start getting pretty deep. Some of those could also be third-party APIs that you don't actually control or own yourself. And we'll look at problems that that could cause as well. So API has grown wide. Um, like I said, many, many uh, endpoints exposed. Uh, one issue here can be that you could end up in situations where the same access token can call any of these endpoints, meaning you don't, you lose kind of control over yeah, I issued a token for you so that you were supposed to call this one endpoint, but now you're calling a bunch of other endpoints. That's obviously not good. Um, this could be somewhat mitigated with scopes. So I can issue a token that contains a specific scope that is scoped to a specific endpoint. For example, the API could check there. Um, it helps somewhat if it's a really large um, API and you have a lot of endpoints, this could end up being problematic. Who has heard about uh, the term role explosion? <laughs> I knew you would, but yeah, it, I mean, it's nothing new, right? And it's something that we, to some degree, have been able to move a little bit away from. Um, definitely not entirely, but where I've been before, I've seen organizations that have more roles than than actual users, something, something's not right with that, right? I mean, it's like, do you have, you have so many corner cases that you have to have more roles than users, that, that doesn't add up. I'm not saying it's that bad, but scopes and only leveraging scopes for authorization could lead to essentially the same problem, scope explosion. You end up having so many scopes and, and it's hard to manage 
API has grown deep, like we looked at, um, is when um, a call to one endpoint of your API invokes um, multiple subsequent API calls, and it could be to other third-party uh, downstream services. That can be dangerous. Um, why could that be dangerous? Well, so if we have a client, the client gets, it's not pictured here really, but the client gets issued a job from the identity provider essentially. Um, the client is calling um, an API using that job. So far, so good, right? <clears throat> but if we use the same job to call another API, that it in its turn is using the same job to talk to a third party service. All of a sudden this third party API service that we don't own and we don't control have this job. What if that service now calls my API? Because it actually has the API that's allowed to call that API, that, that exposed endpoint. So that's obviously not good. So let's look at some of the ways we can mitigate some of these problems. Um, and none of this is really rocket science, to be honest. Um, but before we do, we got to look at sort of what, what building blocks do we have for this. Tokens is the first one. I already mentioned it. But what tokens do good is that they can transport attributes that we can use to perform authorization. And that's different levels of authorization. I mentioned scope, and scope could be used to some form of, of authorization. It's not all bad. Um, we still use roles, <laughs> even though role explosion is the thing. Um, scopes, as I see it, is much, much more of a coarse grain authorization. It's sort of like the first check. If you don't even have the scope, like there's no point in even continuing, right? Uh, we'll look at that a little bit more later in the, uh, where we can em enforce authorization at different layers. Tokens are issued differently, so you're not always going to get the same token. You're not even going to get the same type of token, depending on which client you are, which app you are, and, and what the token is intended for. So it depends heavily on what the, the client that's requesting the token, what type of token it's getting. Um, with that, when you request a token, when the client requests a token, it can say, I, I'm requesting these scopes. That could um, lead to other things, though. It doesn't have to only mean that, okay, we're going to give you the scope that you requested. I mean, we can obviously deny access to those scopes because you weren't allowed to for some reason. But we can also do mapping of scopes to claims, and I'll get to claims in a little bit, but... That can happen, so you can get a bunch of claims into your token, and the claims values are pretty dynamic, and can the value for that can come from wherever, and that's actually very powerful. Um, tokens are typically bound to a specific application or API. It's something that we call audience. Um, they're, they're essentially meant to be for a specific application so that a different application shouldn't necessarily have it. There could be fancy ways of doing that, too. There was another talk here earlier today, and I actually talked about it, I think, at last year's Identiverse. There, there's, um, if you start looking at the technologies and techniques in um, FOPI, financial grade APIs, this token binding can actually be made cryptographically, meaning I get um, what's called a certificate bound um, token or proof of possession token. It's essentially that you couple um, cryptographic information with the token so that it can't be lost or stolen. So that's definitely something to look into if you have sort of higher security APIs as well. I'm not going to go into detail on that here. but So with these claims, we can, uh, if I request a specific scope, the scope can be mapped. This is ma in the identity server, essentially. The scope can be mapped to claims. So if I request scope, a scope that's called records. I can get a bunch of other claims associated with that scope. And the claims can hold values. In the identity server, which is what Curity does, we can get those claim values from any number of different underlying sources. And this becomes pretty powerful because all of a sudden we now have 
attribute data and information in the token that is assured by an identity provider, right? Um, minted into a token, and we can then use these attributes for authorization of APIs pretty dynamically, essentially, because every time a new token is issued, that claims value could have changed. It's probably not likely to change all the time, but it could have, especially if we get it from, you know, Active Directory or something like that. The user has moved to a different department, then all of a sudden you shouldn't have access to a specific API or something like that. So claims are assertions that allows the API to kind of trust the attribute, right? It's, it's the identity server that says, I assert that Alice is a teller in California, if that's what, is that, if that's what the claim is. Um, claims also allow the user to consent what information that, the, that get, essentially gets minted into the token, but everybody has probably seen when you log in with Google or something like that, sometimes you get that pop-up that says with a bunch of check boxes and it asks you, do you, are you okay with releasing your email address and your address and all this information? That's the, that's the consent screen and you're consenting to that information being released and it's probably ending up in, in a token somewhere. So claims-based authorization means then that we can use this claim information and claim data to perform authorization. And this could be done at a bunch of different layers. We'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about that, but um, this is something that can be checked directly in the API. It's probably not the recommended way, I would say. You would probably want to leverage some kind of reverse proxy or an API gateway in front of the APIs that can do this kind of work because they're pretty good at it. That's, that's their point. That's why they're there. Uh, but one thing to check is that, or that the API, if I say API, I mean API gateway or API, so we don't have to constantly uh, clarify that. But one thing that should be checked um, for sure is the audience claim. That is what, what is telling the API what the token was issued for. Which audience was it issued for? If I get a token from, a, from the wrong audience, well, then I, sh I, shouldn't, I shouldn't even bother. I should just deny immediately. There are other claims, default claims and um, tokens that you should check for too. And they're, they're, I didn't even list them here because they're so obvious. Um, expiration, for example. If the token is expired, well, then you shouldn't have access, right? Um, issuer is another thing that you might want to check to see that it's a valid issuer that has issued the token or is it that's your issuer. But then we get to the custom claims, and that's what I mentioned before. You could, that, this is where you can get fancy um, around what, how do you authorize access to this API? I mean, there's obviously kind of simple authorization mechanisms in, in terms of I can, I can control and check a bunch of claims in the token. And the result of that could be, yes, you get access to the API or you don't. So that becomes sort of a yes or no access to the API as a whole. Um, but you can obviously also start doing more finer grained authorization at that point and say, yeah, well, these are the only pieces of information that the API is allowed to release based on the claims that you have. That starts getting pretty complicated to implement directly in an API because you need to implement code directly in the API that performs fine grain authorization checks based on the claims. That's why we want that entitlement management system that I talked about later too. Um, so a token can have many different shapes and forms. Everyone in here is probably familiar with the term JOT, right? JSON web token. It's a pretty common format of a token. Um, at Curity, we tried to sort of hammer the market with the message that JOTs don't belong in public clients. And this is not a JOT, this is just JSON, but this, this is part of what a JOT could contain. Um, JOT has a header and a signature and stuff like that too, but the this is the data essentially inside of a JOT. Or 
this is also the day that it belongs in a by reference token or an opaque token, although this is not what gets passed around. So in public clients, you should use by reference or opaque tokens. It's ju that's just a string. That's all that there is. It doesn't mean anything to anyone that finds it. A jot can contain this, but a jot can also contain a bunch of PII information, and that's why we don't want it released to public clients because you pass around a bunch of data that doesn't really belong out there. Typically, it's the API in the end that needs that PII information, and the API is probably on the inside and not the outside, so then you're fine. There are patterns to handle that. Uh, I'm not gonna cover them here because it's too short. It's probably its own talk, but um, we, we talk often about something called the phantom token pattern where publicly we issue an opaque token that doesn't mean anything. When the client calls the API, the API is responsible for replacing the opaque token with a jot. So it basically runs an introspection call to the identity provider and say, here's the opaque token I have. And then the identity provider issues a jot corresponding to that opaque token back. And all of a sudden, now we're on the inside, right? Because we're inside of the API gateway. And now we can pass around a jot. It's the same information, but yeah. Um, so then when we get to these deep APIs, remember the problem of the third party call, the call to the third party microservice, um, where, where we don't want to lose control over that jot to the public third or the public, the third party API that we don't control. That's when token sharing comes in. <clears throat> there are a couple of different ways of handling that specific thing. You can do uh, something called token exchange, which is described here. Um, that basically means that a token is issued, but when it's time, and so you can use this token to this service here. When it, when it comes time for this service to call an, a subsequent API, this service um, calls the, the issuer and says, hey, I have this token, but I want a different token. And so then we issue a new token. So you perform an exchange of a token. Typically what happens in that whole process is that you can't upscope, if you know what I mean by that. You can only downscope. So you can't, you can't, this has a much more access than what this token has because this service might also be able to call, you know, other subsequent services there too. And so it's probably going to call um, the issuer here and say, hey, I have this token, um, but I want a new token with only scope X that's valid for this specific API that it's about to call right now. If it's calling more than that, than that API, then you, you might want to exchange more tokens. But then you get into the aspect of, well, this API now, the first one that we're hitting, if it's calling five, 10 subsequent APIs, we need to do five, to five to 10 token exchanges. It's, I mean, it's a burden on the, on the issuer there, but most of the time, that's not really going to be a super big performance issue. But there's alternative methods for that, which could be this way instead, where you embed tokens. So when the first token gets issued, it actually issues a bunch of tokens. So you can have, and in that sense, <laughs> okay, I'm going to make an exception to the rule I just uh, said. In that sense, we would want to issue a JOT, but it's a JOT that contains a, wraps a bunch of other tokens, and those could be opaque tokens. So we have a JOT that doesn't contain any PII information. It just becomes sort of a convenient um, transportation mechanism for wrapping uh, several other tokens that we know we're going to need subsequently for calling additional APIs. So we can perform this authorization at many different levels. And if you think about it, there's sort of a, an authorization level even at the entry point of the token service when a token is issued, right? Because there we can first, if a user is involved, there's some kind of authentication, right? That's the first level of it. If you don't, if 
success, if authentication is not successful, you're not even gonna get a token. So that's like number one. Um, but then it's up to the token service to sort of what kind of token am I gonna issue for this client? There's some level of authorization on that. Uh, once the token is issued, the client will call the API gateway where we can typically perform um, and what we typically wanna do there is coarse grain authorization, right? Like you're giving me this, this token, is that token even allowed to call the API at all? If it's not, I mean, that's where, we, that's where we can do some checks on scopes in the token. If it doesn't have the scope for the records API, well, don't call the records API. The API gateway can just deny it right there, right? So we don't have to burden the API with a bunch of calls that are not valid. You can perform fine grain authorization in the API gateway too. It's a pretty good, place to do it. You can also do that directly in the API. It depends on the use case and depends on what you're going to do and how much of a fine-grained authorization you are going to do. If you start getting into um, like field level redaction of specific information, that can be hard to do here. I'm not saying that it's impossible, but it can be harder to do here. It might be easier to do in the, in the API. Okay, so last but not least, this is like teeing up your, David and um, Galena sitting in the front here, who have, they have a conversation tomorrow um, at 11, right? 11 o'clock in the main ballroom or whatever it's called? Juniper. In Juniper, around um, fine-grained authorization, right? Th this specific topic. So the entitlement management system, if anyone is at all familiar with SACML, it, they, SACML uses the term policy decision point or PEP. That is essentially what this piece here would be. It's an externalized engine that holds an authorization policy that anything can call. The API gateway can call it, the API can call it. Actually, the identity management system can call it because there might be a policy in place in the entitlement management system that defines which claims I can put into a token. So, this, this system here can be used by any number of services. It, it, it doesn't only like fit into this model here, but it fits well into this model. So typically the components of the entitlement management system is there's some level of sort of policy administration point. Um, it's, a, it's the piece where we create the policy, author the policy. The decision point is the engine that holds the policy and makes the decision. It gets an incoming call and it's gonna make a decision. And then we have these other um, policy information point is the way for the entitlement management system or more specifically the PDP to get hold of additional information and data in order to make its decision. And then at the end, the policy enforcement point. And this could be almost anything. But in this scenario, the policy enforcement point fits extremely well into an API gateway because it's sitting in front of the API, right? So enforcing this authorization decision in the API gateway works perfectly. A lot of the API gateways in the market also kind of directly support these entitlement management system and has some kind of direct plugin to, to handle all the communication and things like that. And so in this case here, you have a token, you're calling the API, but it's the records API. The, the API would then call a PDP um, and it's gonna ask something like, I, can't, I, I know that it's Alice, I know that it's records that, it's, that she's trying to get. Um, can Alice get records? And yeah, then we, the, this component here could theoretically add on this thing here that oh, you can only get records where the user is Alice and department it's sales based on this policy down here. So we did like, we performed the fine grained authorization and to, like Alice was just trying to get all the records, but the end result because of this policy held here, you're only gonna get records where Alice is the user and the, the department is sales. Basically the policy says she can only view records that she owns and that uh, is in her own department, basically. So 
there's a lot of fancy things that can be done with this, but this is very powerful. So you, as you can see, we've gone from sort of like very coarser grain to much, 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 and now we're at the extreme fine-grained authorization decision that the API can, can make in order to authorize what data is released. And the token in this case is a pretty central part to transport and hold the user information, user attributes, and user data that in this case ends up being used by this authorization engine. So, conclusion quickly. Leverage the audience claim and other claims to perform authorization decisions based on that. Um, use token sharing approaches, um, whether it's wrapped tokens or token exchange to um, alleviate issues around deep APIs and especially third-party um, APIs that are called, um, and make use of multi-layered authorization and highly recommend to look at entitlement management systems um, as well. And that was that. Now the bar is open. <laughs> uh, I know we're one minute over, and, and, but I have, I, I'm not running to another session, so I have time to answer questions if you have any. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I saw the slide about uh, token sharing. Yeah. Token sharing is one major Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, you have to have a mechanism. It's, I don't think wrapped tokens in that regard is not a standard. Maybe I should repeat the question. Um, around the, the slide of token exchange, and um, there was a, the concept of wrapping tokens in there, and how does wrapping tokens help in this scenario? Because I'm, I'm assuming that you're thinking that you're still sending like the, the all-access token also. So there needs to be some kind of mechanism that the API or API gateway n can map one of these tokens inside of the wrapped token and, and be responsible for using that token to the appropriate party that it's calling it to, right? The wrapped tokens could, could potentially contain, I mean, they can contain whatever. They, they are just a real token like the, the full-blown token is, right? So, so the wrapped token can contain different scopes and claims that are appropriate for the API that they are intended for. But yeah, you're, you're releasing some of the um, decisions around how to use those tokens to the API, if that makes sense. But you're not going to send the, the full access token onto the third party API. The idea is that inside of your full blown access token, you have a subscoped token that you can automate that you can send to the third party API. Yep. The, is the interface between the API and the entitlement management system standardized? So basically like this part here, right? Um, well, <laughs> so Xacomel, which is an OASIS standard, yes, it is, that is, it's standardized. The format of how, what the request looks like is standardized, yeah. Um, but the communication protocol is not standardized. It's kind of like, I know if David was still here, he would say, you can send the request with a carrier pigeon and still be compliant to the standard because they haven't, they, they haven't defined with what mechanism should you call the PDP. So it's up to the implementer of the Xacomel PDP in like what communication protocol to use. Usually it's REST. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a, a lot of that, a lot of the, how this should happen is standardized in Xacomel for sure. Yeah. What about the message format? The message format is, is standardized too. Yes. 
So for Xacomel, it's XML or, or JSON, but because they have, originally it was XML and then they added the, like the JSON profile of Xacomel, so they extended the standard to support no, JSON. Yeah. You can't you can't necessarily hook in an an enforcement point to an application that you haven't developed. Yeah, but it, so if you walk around, so well, they've closed the expo now. So so maybe next year come back and talk to them. But um, the, so what exactly what you're describing is a challenge that I'm sure all of them would talk about and address in, so, in slightly different ways. But ac the, the ones that were here, axiomatics, plain ID. Styra, which has this, that's open policy agent. Styra is the vendor behind it. You have Signal, for example. So there's a bunch of vendors that do it. They all do it a little bit differently, but this is also the reason, you remember on the first day when, what's his name? Durant, in his presentation, or maybe it was um, Andy Hindle, I, I don't remember who it was, but it was in one of the opening keynotes. They talked about sort of authorization is the thing that we haven't really made that much progress on the last 15 years. And, and he basically said, it's gonna be more on that next year. Yeah, because we still delegate the enforcement to the application itself. Yeah. Unlike authentication, that is dedicated to the IDP. Yeah. The application still to the enforcement, even though you have the delegation of the same point with that. Yeah. But the, and the, but the enforcement is the hard part there. It's, it, it is the hard, that's why it fits well in an API gateway, because then you know where the enforcement could be. It's like, it's sitting in line, it's easy. As soon as you sit in line, it's pretty easy to have the enforcement point. But if you don't, then it gets much harder. In general, authorization is a carbon Yes, it is, it is. It is, and we, all, and we always talk about sort of, we always have the, when we exemplify it, it is always, is like, I can only view a record that I own. But that's not, I mean, that could be a policy, but it's a pretty trivial policy, and it's really easy to express that policy. So it's a pretty bad example from real life scenario policies are very, very complex and complicated, and yeah. So that's, that's hard too, but to be honest, once you get into it, even complex policies, it's not that hard to write them. The problem is the people that know what the policy should be are like the business owners and they can't write an Xacomel policy and they don't know Rego, so they can't write the policy. So it needs to be a huge collaboration of what does the policy look like? Because the people that know what it should be, they can't express the policy and the people that can express the policy don't necessarily understand all of the business and what the rules should look like. That's one part of the problem, um, but a huge part is this enforcement point and like how do you intercept, the, especially when you have off the shelf applications, it's pretty, e I mean that the enforcement point is not that hard to do for your homegrown applications because there's a bunch of libraries usually that can handle this and you can like inject yourself into the, to the stream of that. But when you don't own the code and you don't own the application, it's much harder. Yeah, right. Yeah. Carrying on the slide of thought, do you think that there is a future for something like federated authorization where you know, I buy this SaaS product and I want to, you know, right now I can federate it to my enterprise identity provider, but I can do my single sign on and create my religious identity, but the roles and permissions that are about is defined by the SaaS provider, right? Do you think there's a model where you know, if you really want to have greater control over how your employees say or your customers use a given tool and you set these software applications, that they would be willing to? Possibly. I mean, there's most of these vendors are not at all SaaS, right? Not like there are, there's a newer one called permit.io that is, I think, trying to change that a little bit. I, yeah, possibly. I think also with modernization of applications as a whole, I mean, we, we're going to start seeing a shift. It is, but. I think it's been really slow because it's always been like, well, now we got authentication taken care of, let's do authorization. But it's, the problem is authentication is not really taken care of because 
We're, like, that's why we're all here this whole week is like, oh, we're talking about password lists and we're talking about all these new things of, pass, of, of authentication, right? So we're like, we're kind of going in, cer- we're, we're going in the hamster wheel of authentication and we never get out of it to get to authorization. That's... It might be that design avoiding the hardest problem. Yeah, exactly. We're just kind of like, oh, that's really hard to solve. I, yeah, I don't know, but... <laughs> it's going to solve everything. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. There's some plugins for API gateways. Yeah. Kong is a really good one that has a bunch of. Yeah, we actually use Kong. Okay. Yeah, they have, a, they have an OPA plugin and whatnot. What was that? No, but it's it does the same thing, but it's a, it's just a different. It's not a, and it's and then you get into the problem that OPA is not a standard, right? So if you want to if you want it standards based, yeah, then then you can't go OPA. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so. Yeah. The, talk. I would talk to. If are you going to be here tomorrow? Go to that talk at eleven, and then ask David afterwards. I don't know what Sacamo what they have, but he. I mean, David was a part of writing the standard. Um. So he knows it well. Um, I don't know what I don't know which gateways they have it for. I know I know Kong is pretty well pluginable, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Ex- we wrote our own for Kong in that that pattern I mentioned earlier, the Phantom token pattern. So we wrote our own plugin, it, and it's like a hundred lines of code or something. It's pretty easy to write those plugins. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yes. Right. <clears throat> so we have a different pattern that we also use. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 So we have a similar we have a similar pattern to that that we call a split token pattern. And in that case, what we what Curity does when we issue the token, we actually issue a jaw, <clears throat> not an opaque token. But what we do is we send the header of the jaw only. That's what we that, that's what the client gets back. So instead of an opaque token. The client gets just the header of the job, which means absolutely nothing, right? And so when it wants to call the API, it sends the header of the job. But when we issue the job, when we send the header back, we hash the header, and then we take that together with the body of the job, and we put it into a cache, like we push it into a cache that the API gateway has access to. Exactly. Like literally at the same time as it's issuing it, it's writing it to a cache that the gateway have, has access to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. <clears throat> yep. Yep. Right. So, yeah, it's it's the same thing. We I know Tyke, the API gateway Tyke, they do it that way. 
Um, I know. Yep. Oh, I think, yeah, we, we do hear that all the time. Yeah. Yeah, we have, like, that's the product market engineering team that I talked about. We, I think we wrote, like, 200 technical articles on our website la last year alone. And it's, it's spectacular, so just, just blank it. Thank you. I'll pass it on for sure. Yeah. I mean, right. There's trade-offs for sure, because that split token pattern in the way that we typically see it. I mean, because we, since we don't own the API gateway, but that's that's another approach that you you basically use the API gateway to proxy the token endpoint, and with that you get the token anyways. Um, which is a good model. The way we've done it sometimes, it's, it, it, you're right, it solves sort of a performance problem to some degree, but then you can have a different problem in that things happen so fast that when the, when the client calls the API, it's, the stuff is not there in the cache yet. So you get a cache miss and then you have to redo the call and yeah. So it kind of depends. Yeah. yeah. For sure. And so you start getting into like, okay, are you running your own gateway or is it like, is it an Apigee hosted gateway or an AW? Like, you know, so it kind of depends heavily on. Look, how does it tell us we deal with both cloud offerings and on-prem offerings, not the APIs, but where the client applications is, you know, and they're calling these and their locality may cause these delayed performance issues. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm in favor of, you know, the iron triangle, so to speak, because I think you can solve some really genuine security problems there and you can do some more interesting things with that. But convincing people to pay the performance penalty on that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that is kind of, 